it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Ariel Ron is the Glenn M. Linden Assistant Professor of U.S. Civil War Era at, the, at Southern Methodist University. He focuses on the interplay of politics and economics in the 19th century America. Dr. Ron has published several articles in scholarly venues, such as the Journal of American History and his book, which, which uh, we'll be hearing about today, Grassroots Leviathan, Agricultural Reform in the Rural North in the Slaveholding Republic, which is forthcoming from the Studies in Early American Economy and Society from the Library Company at Johns Hopkins University Press. And that's not actually out yet, it is forthcoming. It's gonna be coming out on November 20th. We're very excited about that. Um, his research has been supported by, by, excuse me, by the Yale Center for Study of Representative Institutions, the Cornell Society for the Humanities, and the Library, and the Library of Congress's Kluge Center. He earned his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Ron was a P's short-term fellow at the library company in 2008, and a long-term fellow also through the P's program in 2012. Welcome. Thank you, Will. Um, thanks for having me on. Uh, I also wanna thank a bunch of people really at the library company, Jim Green, Kathy Matson, uh, everyone in the print department who uh, helped me locate uh, many of the images you're gonna see today and uh, Connie King in the reading room who made my, um, my time at the library company really uh, both uh, pleasant and uh, productive. So uh, let me uh, share screen here in one second. Try that again. Okay, hopefully you're seeing the um, the full screen now. Looks perfect. And, uh, yeah, looks good, Will? All right, good, I'll get started. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna be talking today about my book, Grassroots Leviathan, Agricultural Reform and the Rural North in the Slaveholding Republic. And let me start out by just talking about uh, the title, which uh, may seem a little idiosyncratic at first, Grassroots Leviathan. Uh, ever since Thomas Hobbes uh, told us that in a uh, state of nature, uh, uh, life is nasty, bruised, and short, uh, the word Leviathan, which was the title he chose for his book uh, about the state, has been a kind of term of art uh, for the state or for a powerful uh, government. Uh, and for, for Hobbes, of course, uh, uh, he favored a royal absolutist uh, form of governance. But uh, ironically, perhaps, the last uh, several hundred years or so have uh, probably shown us that the most powerful governments tend, in fact, to be democratic rather than uh, absolutist. And so that's where the grassroots parts come in, uh, comes in. And I suppose I could have chosen any number of images to illustrate that point. But uh, this, the cover to uh, David Lilienthal's uh, book uh, discussing his time as chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority, subtitled Democracy on the March, uh, seems to make the point as well as anything. Uh, here is an image of uh, um, a democratic uh, government uh, investing in a public works uh, program, uh, the likes of which Thomas Hobbes's Leviathan could only have dreamed of, if even that. Uh, uh, so this is, you know, government by and for the people on some level. And uh, uh, Lewis Mumford made a similar point in commenting on the architecture of the TVA, um, writing in a New Yorker in 1941, here is modern architecture at its mightiest and its best, the pharaohs did not do any better. So again, drawing the contrast with a kind of royal absolutist form of state. So, so at its core, um, this book is about uh, uh, why it is that democracies demand and in fact uh, create powerful governments, or maybe a better way of putting it is uh, capable governments. And it's uh, necessarily also therefore a book about the forces that oppose that kind of democratic state building. Okay, well, that's the big uh, question, but the specific way that I try to get this question is by looking at uh, American agriculture in the period from roughly the American Revolution to the Civil War, and uh, more specifically, Northern agriculture. So I wanna just jump right into the story in media race, and then I'll, I'll pull out a little bit to uh, explain sort of broader stakes and context of uh, what I try to do in this book. So let's go to Syracuse, New York in 1849 when if you had been observing things from uh, some distance, you may have seen along a road uh, traveling east from the city to a small elevation, 
plumes of dust being kicked up on a dry September day as uh, thousands of people made their way to the ninth annual state agricultural fair. Uh, and the sort of a, a outstanding feature of this event, uh, as recorded by just about every observer who set down uh, um, their observations, was the immense number of people, the huge crowds. Uh, really, everybody commented on this. And this was particularly gratifying to the New York State Agricultural Society, which organized the event. Uh, and uh, uh, really, um, in the report, boasted that uh, uh, the event was so massive that the uh, farmers of New York were represented there, quote, almost by their individual presence, as if literally every farmer in New York had showed up. Well, that, of course, was an exaggeration, but there certainly were a lot of farmers there. And one of them uh, was this uh, young man, Benjamin Gu, who uh, walked several miles to Canandaigua, where he boarded uh, trains uh, to the fair and commented in his diary that the trains were absolutely packed, full of people headed uh, towards the exhibition. Uh, he then made similar observations about a boat he observed on the Erie Canal. And when he arrived, it was just uh, more of the same. Here he is saying in his diary that as far as the eye could reach, nothing could be seen but one dense mass of human beings. Then he entered the fair and he was simply uh, amazed by what he saw. Again, he writes in his diary, words will fail to describe the dazzling splendor and unsurpassed beauty and ingenuity here displayed. Well, okay, uh, but you know, Gu was uh, a farm boy. He wasn't even 21 yet at this point. Uh, you know, he was a rube. What did he know of the world? Uh, surely someone a little bit more sophisticated would not be so easily impressed. So let's take Horace Greeley. Um, Greeley had been born on a poor uh, New Hampshire farm, but uh, by this time, he was the famous editor of the mighty New York Tribune. Uh, powered by uh, steam presses, uh, perhaps the largest circulation daily in the country. Presumably he had seen a thing or two, and yet he described um, the fair in basically the same terms as Gu. Here he is writing to his readers that, uh, quote, after passing three or four hours in wandering among and gazing at this bewildering mass of livestock, implements, farm produce, inventions, etc., I have brought away little more than a headache and a more lively idea of that beneficent future to which industry is now hastening. Okay, so this was a, a big event, this fair. Was it, was it uh, unusual? Uh, no, in fact, uh, in this period, uh, we get more and more of these kinds of things. The next uh, New York State Fair in Rochester was even bigger. And similarly, in places like Ohio, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Illinois, uh, uh, and other states as well, um, uh, agricultural fairs of this period drew enormous numbers of people uh, up to and even sometimes surpassing 100,000, which for the antebellum era is, is really stupendous. And uh, observers continued to, to comment on precisely that. So, so given this, it's curious that uh, historians don't talk about agricultural affairs in this period more often. Uh, if you were to take a survey course in American history or uh, open a textbook on this period, uh, you would no doubt find some um, pretty extensive discussions of things like uh, evangelical um, camp meetings that drew thousands uh, of people, uh, partisan uh, uh, political rallies that again drew thousands of people, maybe some urban parades. These are considered the mass sort of events of the era, uh, but it, it's, it's unlikely that you'll see so much as a mention, much less uh, any extensive discussion of these agricultural fairs, which, which I, um, uh, I would characterize as sort of uniquely rural instances of the modern mass society that was uh, beginning to emerge in this period. So uh, the first question is, is, why is that? Why don't we hear more about this? And to sort of uh, uh, deepen uh, the mystery and also the stakes of this question, let's go somewhere else uh, to another set of events seemingly uh, uh, distant and maybe unrelated, uh, but as we'll see soon, they are related. Uh, and take a look at uh, a Congress uh, in 1862 at the start of the Civil War in Washington, DC. Uh, in 1862, Congress uh, passed um, a series of landmark laws. Among them, uh, it created the US Department of Agriculture and the land grant university system. And these are, are very important uh, policies. Uh, the USDA and the land grant universities would form the core of a quite massive uh, government agricultural complex that emerged uh, after the Civil War, uh, most fully at the end of the 19th century, uh, um, uh, transforming American agriculture and uh, uh, significantly reshaping the American economy, uh, American higher education, and in the 20th century, really influencing agricultural transformation the world over, not just in the US. Um, so, so those are important, uh, uh, really important pieces of legislation. We don't hear much about 
them either. I should say we hear a lot about the land-grant university because the, the, those universities themselves have a, uh, an interest in preserving their history, but often uh, uh, somewhat narrowly uh, as part of the history of higher education and not um, uh, something bigger than that necessarily. The USDA, there, there's very little on the early history of the USDA, despite the fact that this is a, a, an absolutely crucial uh, government agency um, from, the mid, from the late 19th century on. All right, well, what connects uh, uh, these government agencies to the fairs? To answer that question, I first of all want to take us yet to yet another uh, more distant set of events, and that is the, um, the 1848 failed uh, revolution in France. Uh, by 1852, uh, Louis Napoleon had uh, proclaimed the end of the Republic and uh, uh, declared himself emperor, uh, opening the, the Third Empire. What, what went wrong with the revolution, uh, at least from the perspective of uh, sort of democracy and small r republicanism? Well, uh, uh, Karl Marx, uh, looking rather dapper in this picture, uh, thought that he had an answer, and uh, at least a big part of it was that it was the peasants. And, and what he meant by that simply was that the peasants were uh, a primary constituency, a major support base for uh, Louis Napoleon. And that was because of their sort of inveterate reactionary nature. Now, why were they uh, so reactionary? Well, according to Marx, it was because of this. Uh, here he writes in this uh, famous uh, book, The 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. Marx writes, uh, quote, insofar as there is merely a local interconnection among these small holding peasants, and the identity of their interest begets no community, no national bond, and no political organization among them, they do not form a class. They are consequently incapable of enforcing their class interest in their own name. And what Marx uh, means here by them not being able to form a class is that they remain highly localized, concerned with uh, a, a very sort of local, small, uh, petty uh, uh, kind of concerns. Uh, they're uh, are not able to see the way that their interests uh, are um, shared with other peasants and other sort of similar communities around them. And as a result, uh, because they are uh, sort of unaware and isolated and unable to communicate uh, form political organizations, they cannot uh, represent themselves as sort of befits their, their place in an emerging modern uh, nation state. Uh, instead, they, they look for a kind of outside savior to deal with their problems. And Louis Napoleon comes to play that part for them. And so in Marx's telling, they are, um, uh, uh, an important uh, constituency that really determines Louis uh, Napoleon's uh, uh, victory. So Marx follows up this analysis with a kind of ironic uh, uh, homespun insult uh, that uh, became rather famous. He writes that the great mass of the French nation is formed by a simple addition of homologous magnitudes, much as potatoes in a sack form a sack of potatoes. And here what he means is, you know, th these, these, these potato eating peasants uh, um, uh, if, you, if you put them all together, you get nothing extra from combining them. They remain these sort of isolated individual pieces, uh, much like potatoes in a sack merely form a sack of potatoes. And I guess, I don't know, nothing more than that. No mashed potatoes. Um, uh, all right. Well, I, I don't know what the merits of this as, are as, as history. I'm not sure that historians uh, would still explain the 1848 revolutions in France in this way. But it's instructive as sociology. And what I mean by that is if we sort of abstract from the French case, uh, what Marx is saying here, we get a picture of small holding farmers that is quite common uh, and quite prevalent. And that's the idea that these are um, uh, traditional sort of uh, inherently conservative people who are concerned uh, just with their locality, uh, are, are quite isolated, uh, not in communication with others, uh, and uh, not particularly interested in or aware of what's going on beyond uh, uh, the sort of uh, uh, borders of their our local community. Uh, and the way this might go in the uh, uh, case of American farmers, as we would say, um, <clears throat> uh, that they're you know, not interested uh, uh, and sort of resentful of any kind of intrusion from a distant Washington, DC. Uh, uh, however, I think that this sort of characterization is really um, not very useful for thinking about uh, American farmers, even in the 19th century, because they were really anything but a sack of potatoes. Uh, instead, what they were was a well-networked social formation, uh, open to political activation in ways that really have not been uh, understood uh, um, uh, very well in American history. So that, that leads me basically to, to this. This is, the, this is basically the argument of the book in the most concise possible uh, visual form that I could come up with. Uh, the fairs uh, represent uh, farmers uh, uh, organized and they had some a major impact on the creation of the national state that emerged uh, out of the Civil War.
Okay, that's the basic idea. Let's, uh, let, me, let me try to flesh that out a little bit. But before I, I get into sort of the details, I want to take a step back and um, just give some sort of a, a basic picture of what uh, American society looked like uh, in the mid 19th century uh, that I don't uh, think always gets the attention that uh, it, it really deserves. So, so the first thing to say, uh, and this is the first line of the book, uh, is that the United States was an overwhelmingly rural society before the Civil War. Uh, and I, I think this is a, a very uh, important fact. So let me show you what I mean. Uh, in 1860, 80% of Americans lived in rural places of 2,500 inhabitants or fewer. 59% of the labor force worked in agriculture, only 15% in manufacturing. Now you might say, well, you know, these are national figures. Um, don't they obscure some significant regional variation? And, and they do to some degree. But if you just look uh, at the North, you're going to get uh, fundamentally uh, a similar picture, right? 75% uh, um, of the North remains rural. And even in the Northeast, the most industrialized part of the country, 64%, uh, almost two thirds of the people are in rural areas. Uh, either directly working in agriculture or otherwise closely connected to agriculture in some kind of um, uh, associated uh, business or, or business that's dependent on agriculture one way or another. And uh, just this uh, justified uh, contemporaries in sort of uh, making observations that characterized the society they understood themselves to be living in. Here is uh, Jesse Buell, a, a well-known farm editor from upstate New York writing that agriculture is the great business of civilized life. And this is sort of, uh, you know, pretty self-evident to people at the time. Here is uh, Abraham Lincoln in 1858 uh, commenting, you know, pretty casually and offhandedly that in the nature of things, they, meaning the farmers, are uh, more numerous than any other class, right? This is a society that, that uh, uh, cannot imagine anything other than a large majority of farmers and agriculture at the sort of base of the economy and the, uh, uh, the, the social system. But this leads to a question, I think, uh, what exactly do we mean by farmer? Or maybe a better thing to ask is what image comes to mind when we uh, think of farmers in this period? And I would suggest that um, something, something like this is what we tend to think of. Uh, uh, the yeoman farmer, the uh, sort of a Jeffersonian agrarian ideal, uh, farmers uh, working with um, you know, fairly simple hand tools and traditional methods, uh, primarily focused on establishing their own sort of personal and familial independence, establishing a family on a farm uh, without the interference of uh, sort of big government or really anybody else to bother them. Uh, this is the, the kind of, I think, idea that most people have of what uh, uh, farmers other than say, you know, large slaveholding planters were about in this period. And um, I, I you know, I don't think I'm imagining this. Here is a, a, a recent example, a book published in 2016 that, um, you know, takes as its starting point this idea of an agrarian republic, a, a, a country composed of farmers of this sort. And I should say, I don't mean to, to pick on this book. This is a, a good book in many ways, but it, is, it does, I think, take for granted the notion that uh, the sort of Jeffersonian agrarian ideal is uh, the best way, really the obvious way, to think about farmers in this period. And I want to suggest that that is um, perhaps not quite right, or at least not the full picture. Uh, and maybe I should, I should say at this point that um, the survival of this idea of the yeoman farmer uh, uh, probably has something to do with the fact that it's a very a kind of appealing image uh, of um, uh, the citizen in a kind of modern uh, uh, democratic nation state. And um, uh, that's not unique to the United States. Um, here is the Japanese novelist and literary critic Kobo Abe commenting uh, uh, really in the wake of World War II um, uh, that, uh, quote, even in the advanced industrial countries, the image of the authentic citizen still remains that of the good farmer, right? And so this is an, a thing that applies in Japan, it applies in France, and many other countries, uh, the notion that uh, the good farmer is the kind of ideal type of um, the authentic citizen. And, and why is that? Well, farmers are close to the land. Uh, they're the sort of keepers of tradition. They exemplify uh, virtues such as hard work uh, and sort of not asking for anything. Uh, and so uh, 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 the yeoman farmer really fits all of that kind of imagery. Uh, 
Uh, but I would suggest that um, uh, this uh, kind of imagery is just as good a way to understand uh, American farmers in the mid 19th century. This is the uh, frontispiece to um, a textbook published in the United States in 1848 entitled Scientific Agriculture. And it is uh, suggesting that uh, all kinds of uh, scientific and technological um, uh, advances are uh, applicable or should be applied uh, to agriculture, right? So this is not the image of the traditional conservative yeoman, but someone who is somehow forward-looking and attempting to uh, modernize agriculture. And that's really uh, uh, the big idea um, for, for me. Uh, 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 or I should say maybe that's, that's the major finding of, of my book. I, I show how um, northern middle-class farmers and uh, rural businessmen built an enormous agricultural reform movement key to the slogan of scientific agriculture that they used to institutionalize their presence in a reimagined state apparatus. And that's what brings me to the title, Grassroots Leviathan, a popular state building machine in, of all places, the countryside, where I suppose uh, we would not expect to find state building uh, uh, energies. Uh, and then uh, uh, just to flag the point that will come up later, uh, uh, this uh, involved confronting um, the slave power, or that is the power of slaveholder interest in Washington, DC. So let me continue here. Um, all right, so, so, so now we have this, okay? Organized farmers uh, in the form of the fairs plus uh, uh, scientific agriculture, uh, uh, is what I'm calling the agricultural reform movement. They had this big influence on uh, uh, the development of government policy. Uh, and in particular, I wanna stress in the year 1862, the first sort of full year of the Civil War would suggest that this had something to do with uh, the break with slavery. Okay, but before getting into all that, what, what exactly was the agricultural reform movement? Well, uh, as a matter of institutions and organizations, it was really composed of three uh, primary entities. Um, uh, to begin with, you had agricultural societies, which were these sort of all-purpose farmers organizations, uh, primarily at the county and state level, sometimes at the town level. Eventually, there was also a kind of national organization as well. And they did a variety of things, but the most important thing that they did was put on annual agricultural fairs, as you see in the top right here. And what's being depicted there is a plowing match, which was a, a typical event at these fairs. And then finally, you have agricultural uh, periodicals, the emergence of a specialized farm press that began to link farmers uh, to each other uh, across locales. And now some, some evidence for the size and significance of this movement. Uh, here you see uh, an indication of the rise of uh, agricultural periodicals in the period. Uh, uh, they, they rise uh, quickly and uh, significantly. If we try to account for population growth over the same period, you see again a, a dramatic initial rise in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, uh, and what appears to be a flattening out in the 1850s, although what this really indicates is consolidation in the business of agricultural publishing even as circulation continued uh, to grow. And uh, a circulation of 500,000 or even a little bit less than that is very large, especially in, um, in light of uh, contemporary reading practices, which involve a lot of sharing, a lot of people sharing uh, subscriptions, uh, 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 copying uh, uh, um, and clippings uh, uh, and sending them to neighbors, uh, and a whole lot of reprinting in the regular press. So this, there, this is a very widely circulated discourse that connects uh, farmers across locales. All right, are we talking about actual farmers in this movement? Or is this instead a kind of movement of, you know, a town and urban middle class people, uh, some elites who are trying to impose a modernization program on the countryside? Well, uh, to look to, to try to answer that question, I constructed this uh, table, uh, which is composed um, uh, to begin with of sort of various uh, entities in the agricultural reform movement. You have here the publishing committee of uh, the Practical Farmer, which was a, a small uh, agricultural journal. You have the subscribers in one town to the Cultivator, which was a large agricultural journal. You have the executive committee of a, a, a county agricultural society and other sort of, uh, of things like this. Uh, and over here, using uh, manuscript census data, uh, I try to uh, determine the number of farmers in these uh, various uh, groups. And as you can see, the number is very large. So I think uh, I can say with confidence that we are talking about many actual uh, farmers in this uh, large movement. 
All right, well, so what was agricultural reform about really? Uh, uh, here are the sort of fundamental, the, the basic economic aspects of uh, the movement. Uh, <clears throat> it aimed to introduce uh, science and technology into American farming, or I should say, uh, introduce new science and technology. Agriculture is itself a, a major technological innovation. So there's no sort of pre-technological agriculture, but there are sort of phases uh, uh, in which it changes. And um, in this period, uh, the points of emphasis were uh, new implements and machines, uh, chemical fertilizers and other soil amendments to maintain soil fertility, uh, new kinds of crop rotations also to uh, maintain soil fertility and uh, increase agricultural productivity. And finally, something that doesn't appear on this uh, uh, advertisement are uh, improved uh, livestock, uh, sheep, cattle, horses, uh, and, and really the whole range of livestock. Mm -hmm. Those are the big economic uh, things. Uh, but for my purposes, the more interesting uh, uh, aspects of agricultural reform are actually the political ones, and in particular, the mode of organization. And here I wanna uh, refer back to uh, James Madison's famous argument in the Federalist Number 10, which has come to be known as uh, the extended republic uh, thesis or a hypothesis, perhaps. Um, Madison here was uh, uh, arguing that the larger the country was, uh, the better the chances that no tyranny of the majority would emerge, right? That there would never be a case where uh, um, uh, some segment of the population, maybe the majority, would sort of all uh, uh, work together to dispossess or otherwise oppress uh, the remaining portion of the population. And his argument was that in a large country, or as he puts it here, if you extend the sphere, you make it less probable that a majority of the whole will have a common motive. And then he continues, or if such a common motive exists, it will be more difficult for all who feel it to discover their own strength and to act in unison with each other. Well, the institutions of uh, agricultural reform sort of vitiated that check in the one place where it should have been the most secure. That is in uh, rural areas, which by definition are uh, uh, highly dispersed areas that would be difficult to bring uh, people together to sort of work in political unison. But agricultural reform uh, uh, did that uh, through the journals and the societies. So what did they do exactly? What kind of influence did they begin to exert? Here you see that from the 1840s, there's a clear evidence of influence at the state level. Uh, uh, state governments began to subsidize agricultural societies, uh, agricultural fairs, and also in various indirect ways to subsidize uh, the movement by, uh, in particular, printing very large numbers of these annual agricultural reports, which not only sort of contributed to the uh, print discourse on agricultural reform that circulated uh, out among the public, but also began to link uh, uh, agricultural organizations and their farmer members to state agencies. And this sort of thing was repeated uh, on the federal level uh, in the subsequent decade in the 1850s, when uh, Congress uh, um, authorized the Patent Office to print uh, annual agricultural reports in a really quite staggering numbers, uh, 100,000 uh, uh, reports, 200,000 reports, 300,000 reports in a year. These are numbers that rival uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was the runaway bestseller of these years. So just enormous uh, numbers of these reports in circulation. And, and they're full of quite dry and uh, technical uh, information about farming. Uh, and yet, uh, there's a lot of evidence that they were quite popular uh, and, and avidly sought after. Uh, well, at the national level, it became really significant that this movement was in fact uh, dominated by uh, Northern voices. And in this table, I, I try to construct some measures to show that. And, and basically here, we're looking at agricultural organizations. You can see that both in absolute terms and in various sort of per capita uh, or, uh, measures, uh, or various normalized measures, um, the, the North dominates um, both absolutely and relatively. Uh, uh, and it is clearly the much more sort of uh, represented and powerful voice within the agricultural reform movement. Uh, here's some more evidence. Uh, the Southern Cultivator, probably the leading uh, Southern agricultural journal uh, in the 1850s has a circulation of maybe 10,000, whereas many Northern journals have circulations that far exceed that. All right, so in order to explain this uh, Northern bias within the movement, I, I developed this uh, geographic uh, concept of the greater Northeast, which is not so much a particular place as a set of conditions. 
as uh, sort of demonstrated in these maps. And, and the, the main characteristics here are that there are cities surrounded by a relatively dense rural hinterlands, that they are relatively egalitarian or at least relatively egalitarian compared to the slave South, uh, and that they're sort of well supplied with transportation and uh, communication facilities. And what you see in these two maps, uh, first of all, what, on the maps themselves, um, the dots represent cities, the lines represent major transportation routes, canals and railroads, and uh, the shaded areas represent uh, rural population density, or more specifically, free rural population density. So we're excluding slaves here. And the reasoning behind that is that, uh, of course, slaves uh, would not have been allowed to join agricultural organizations, to subscribe to agricultural journals. Of course, uh, uh, it was illegal to teach slaves to read uh, in much of the South, uh, and otherwise to participate in this movement. So these two maps show really two things. They show, first of all, that from 1840 to 1860, these kind of conditions that I describe as the greater Northeast expanded very uh, significantly across the North. But they also show just how vast the difference is between the North and the South when it comes to kind of eligible rural populations for participating in an agricultural reform movement. So that's the geography. What about the political economy? This part is important for understanding how uh, agricultural reform entered into politics. And basically, the, 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 the basic uh, idea here is that uh, agricultural modernization plus domestic manufacturing would equal national development, an idea that's really well captured in the frontispiece to this agricultural journal, which shows uh, on the top panel uh, farming, in the middle panel two images of manufacturing, and on the bottom panel a kind of vision of a national economy in which agriculture and manufacturing are reciprocally acting uh, uh, for each other's sort of mutual development. This is a, a, a northern uh, agricultural reform vision of what the economy could be. And this uh, uh, brought agricultural reformers into pretty you know, natural uh, ideological affinity with the Republican Party that emerged in the 1850s. Uh, and we can see this, for instance, in uh, this quotation from William Henry Seward, um, uh, probably the most prominent Republican of the mid to late 1850s, who would become Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of State. Here he is speaking at the 1852 Vermont State uh, Agricultural Fair saying that, quote, a constant and uniform relation must always be maintained between the state of agriculture and indeed of society itself and the contemporaneous state of invention in the arts. And there's actually quite a lot packed into this short quotation. Uh, to begin with, this equation of agriculture with society itself, right? This idea that uh, contemporaries really understood that agriculture as fundamental to their society. But then secondly, that uh, agriculture's condition depends on invention in the arts. Uh, with the arts here, a term that would have embraced manufacturing. So agriculture is really uh, uh, dependent for its progress on invention. This idea is sort of taken a step further in uh, a poem written by uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson as a sort of preface to his uh, 1858 essay, Wealth, an essay that uh, focuses essentially on agricultural improvement. And in this couplet, uh, uh, Emerson says something quite interesting. He writes, new slaves fulfilled the poet's dream galvanic wire, strong shouldered steam. What this couplet does is it juxtaposes slavery with technology, right? Technology is here pictured as the new slaves, the one that will emancipate humanity from the need to coerce one another. Instead, they will be able to essentially coerce nature. And the, um, the personification of steam as strong shoulder really underscores that comparison. Now, of course, it really meant something to uh, invoke slavery in 1858 in the United States. And you can see here that around the same time, uh, uh, the Fox steam plow, uh, a device that never um, was used very much, but certainly uh, was very celebrated at this moment as sort of heralding the future of American farming um, uh, uh, um, in light of uh, Emerson's uh, couplet here, I think takes on significance uh, as sort of illustrating free society's uh, substitution of technology for coerced labor. This is really well demonstrated in this um, uh, certificate from an agricultural society, which actually comes from a couple of decades after the Civil War, but illustrates uh, uh, streams of thought that were already coming into uh, uh, prominence in the 1840s and certainly in the 1850s. So at, at first glance, this might look like a pretty nostalgic and sort of sentimental uh, image here with, um, uh, I think it's probably series here at the top. Uh, but take a second look and you'll see, first of all, there's an awful lot of tech in this uh, image here, we have a steam engine and some other technologies. But the really interesting imagery is here at the bottom. And uh, let's take a closer look at that. 
On the left side, we have some kind of image of ancient Egypt uh, in which an apparently white overseer uh, uh, looks on as dark-skinned uh, slaves use hand tools to harvest a field of wheat. On the right, we have a single uh, white farmer using a mechanical reaper to harvest a very similar uh, wheat field. And the argument that's effectively being made here is that slavery goes with technological backwardness, whereas freedom goes with technological progress, right? Uh, ancient Egypt, slavery, and poor tools on the one hand, um, uh, modern sort of modern United States freedom and uh, uh, new technologies on the other. Uh, and this certainly uh, was uh, a message that was very much compatible with and supportive of the Republicans' anti-slavery uh, message. Well, all right, how do you get more science and technology if that's the aim? I think, uh, you know, somewhat logically, you might want to start with new institutions of agricultural education and research. And in the 1840s and 50s, there was indeed a movement to establish new uh, specialized agricultural colleges. Here we have uh, the map of Farmers College, which uh, existed uh, somewhat short-lived in Ohio in the 1850s with their uh, designs for an exp uh, experimental garden. Here's an image of the first class at uh, Farmers High School in Pennsylvania. Uh, today, that's Penn State University State College with uh, the building, the first building they constructed. Uh, now, these uh, efforts to establish agricultural colleges ran into real financial difficulties uh, with uh, private and state funding in the 1850s. And so agricultural reformers turned uh, naturally, enough, naturally enough to the federal government for more resources. Okay, so here we go. Here's what, what, what we're looking at. The agricultural reform movement composed of societies, fairs, and journals uh, aiming for uh, science and technology as applied to agriculture based in North, uh, trying to get the federal government to establish something like the USDA and the land-grant universities. But there's a problem, and the problem is the slaveholding republic. That is, the structures and interests of slaveholders which hold sway in Washington, D.C. Now, what do I mean by that exactly? Uh, uh, let, I'm going to go through a series of, of somewhat lengthy quotes and then I'm going to boil them down. So uh, 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 going back all the way to the Constitution, here is South Carolina's Charles Pinckney uh, explaining to his constituents why he signed the Constitution and what it will do for them. And a central point for him here is that uh, the general government can never emancipate them, meaning the slaves, uh, because the general government, meaning the federal government, has no powers but what are expressly granted by the Constitution. So limiting the federal government ensures uh, the, free, uh, the safety of uh, slavery for uh, Southern slaveholders. Uh, but here's Virginia's James uh, Murray Mason uh, uh, in 1859, speaking about a pending a legislation for the Morrill Act. And he uh, suggests that this is really dangerous because it will lead, uh, in his view, uh, to the situation where the whole agricultural interest of the country will be taken out of the hands of the states and subjected to the action of Congress, either, either for the promotion of it in one section or the depression, depression of it in another. Um, and finally, we have John C. Calhoun's eldest son, Andrew, also the president of the South Carolina Agricultural Society, saying a variety of things, but, but really basically saying, yes, agricultural colleges are important for the free states, but we don't want them uh, uh, because they are unconstitutional and we will fight strongly against them. So let's boil this all down and simplify things. Here is the Southern argument, right? Um, the federal government poses no threat to slavery as long as it is limited. Unless, however, it begins to get involved in agricultural development and modernization, therefore we will fight these policies tooth and nail. And they do fight them tooth and nail. They in fact uh, obtain, uh, they pressure uh, uh, President Buchanan to veto the moral bill after it is uh, passed in 1859. So uh, uh, under these circumstances, the Republican Party becomes the vehicle, the sort of agent for uh, getting uh, agricultural policies passed at the federal level. And so what happens is that you know, there is both an ideological affinity uh, between the agricultural reform movement and the Republican Party. And that ideological affinity is grounded in the political economy of the North that um, favors uh, this sort of co-development of agriculture and manufacturing. Uh, uh, but there's also increasingly very powerful institutional pressure for these uh, organizations to join forces because the Southerners are constantly obstructing agricultural policy at the federal level in the 1850s, uh, because once again, they are, are, are quite concerned about the federal government getting involved in agriculture, uh, especially with the Republican Party threatening to uh, maybe take control of the federal government 
uh, and use its patronage, pow patronage powers to promote a kind of anti-slavery agriculture in the South. Um, I, you know, I think I'm just going to actually leave it there uh, so that we have time for uh, questions. Uh, um, yeah, I, I'm going to I'm going to leave it there and 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 I think kick it over to Will to um, maybe uh, bring up some questions. Thank you so much, Ariel. Uh, that was wonderful. And uh, if if you're interested in joining the conversation, I encourage you to use the Q and A feature uh, to submit your questions. And until you do, you're going to be stuck with my questions. Um, and so, to that point, I'd like to return to um, Karl Marx's. Uh, sort of starch-based critique of the French Revolution, which is really that, you know, without class solidarity, you just have a sack of individualized potatoes, right? And you've pointed to a whole lot of political activism here amongst American farmers, uh, expressed through the press, societies, agricultural affairs, and then, you know, concrete outcomes. Outside of that political advocacy, do you see class solidarity amongst American farmers? Um, I don't, you know, I don't know if actually class is the best language to, to, to use to talk about farmers or at least, I mean, it's hard to say, farmers don't really compose a single class. There are um, some pretty significant class divisions uh, within uh, within the category of farmers. Uh, and so, you know, in the United States, uh, in the antebellum period, clearly between planters and, and other kinds of farmers, although planters sometimes refer to themselves as farmers, but also between farm owners and farm laborers, you know, very large uh, free farmers and, and smaller ones who uh, maybe own a little bit of property, but um, not enough to really make a living from it. So, so, so there's a lot of uh, variation. I think that what you, you do get is the consolidation of uh, uh, an agricultural interest uh, or a farmer's interest as um, they would would use the term and I, I mean I think it's a, it's a, it is actually an important question because you know uh, I, I'm making the case that this agricultural reform is really represents farmers but of course it's a certain kind of farmer it's it's, it's really in particular middle class and up kind of farmers ones who own enough productive property to make a pretty good living uh, and uh, below that, it's it's maybe aspirational, but um, but there there's certainly plenty of folks, rural folks, who are uh, excluded or not entirely on board with this program. Yeah. So so yeah, I mean there there's there's some kind of solidarity, but it, it's not exactly you know uh, the entirety of rural rural society. Yeah, sure. No, and I mean I'm thinking about like throughout the nativist waves between the 1840s and 1860, really, like. Was there less participation in, in, in those movements in uh, these rural spaces than in um, you know, northeastern cities where there was certainly a lot of participation in nativist movements? Um, because I feel like that would tell us something about the class solidarity that might traverse different sort of um, you know, it, uh, basic immigration backgrounds, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I wasn't um, looking at that question. It's a good question. I wasn't looking at it very much, so I don't remember a whole lot um, about that in, in the sources, except for a couple of things that are sort of indicative. So like uh, at these agricultural fairs, there are often various kinds of contests, like this plowing contest, for instance, or some, some similar things. And what's interesting is um, the people who are who are the winners are often not the ones who are actually doing the work. The, so the, the people who are competing are often the hired workers of some farmer. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes they are um, uh, they're foreign workers. So in one one particular uh, event that I saw, it was a spading match. So it was a gardening kind of competition. And all of the actual participants were Irish and yet the winners the, the 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 sort of official contestants were all you know people um, with uh, uh, anglophone names so uh, yeah I mean there, there's certainly some of that going on mm -hmm. so we actually have now a bunch of questions that have come in uh, Stephen Edelman or sorry Ed Alderman, excuse me my eyes aren't so good in this light here um, asks how important is the availability of capital just in general uh, I mean you know, capital is this agricultural reform movement. 
You know, well, I, it partially depends on what you mean by capital, I suppose. If you mean like finance capital, uh, maybe not uh, so much. Um, if you mean actual physical capital, there's, there's a whole lot of capital formation going on in this period, uh, uh, not just with farms being cleared in sort of new area, but with uh, uh, significant improvements to buildings and so on, for instance. Um, construction of what are called uh, banked barns all over the place. And uh, the idea with banked barns is uh, there's a ramp that where you enter with the carriage on the second floor uh, and unload um, the hay and other things you would need. And then you use gravity to bring it down to the animals on the first floor. And, um, uh, you know, th this is a, it, it involves, you know, a pretty major uh, investment of uh, labor and uh, materials and it significantly improves agricultural productivity. And it's happening all over the place. You have to picture, you know, sort of capital deepening uh, through these investments in many, you know, thousands and thousands of small farms. Uh, uh, plus, of course, investment in all kinds of new tools that are being produced uh, with the, um, you know, the iron and steel that are increasingly uh, available um, uh, uh, as, as sort of mining and manufacturing uh, develop in the country as well. Corey Young, uh, fellow, asks, uh, thanks for the presentation, or begins, thanks for the presentation, then asks, how do you relate your work to that of Caitlin Rosenthal? If Southern enslavers are interested in the modernization are interested in modernization and technological innovation, if we might call them capitalists, what are these Northern farmers? Well, you know, I don't know if I would call them capitalists. Um, I'm just not sure what, if that really helps us see them any more clearly. Um, but they're certainly not anti-capitalist. I mean, they're, they're, they're interested in, uh, the, in, in, taking advantage of the market, being sort of technology savvy, um, uh, increasing productivity and increasing their profitability. I mean, I think, you know, the Caitlin's work shows to me anyway, that um, Southern planters are really focused on uh, the tech sort of technologies that are available to them to wring out as much labor as they can from enslaved workforces. And I think this, you know, also builds on the work of people like Gavin Wright, who show that the, the real uh, advantages to slaveholders of slavery is is not that um, slave labor is quote unquote cheap because in fact um, uh, the investment is quite large, but rather that it uh, it provides managers with total control. And what uh, um, you know uh, Rosenthal's book uh, adds to that is uh, uh, the capacity to sort of monitor and direct uh, slave labor um, using accounting techniques and and all the, the, the sort of, that sort of paper technology that she reveals. Um, the situation in the North is that uh, uh, labor is also scarce, uh, but there is no capacity to command it uh, by purchasing it. And so, you know, tr the, traditionally the, the uh, explanation, the economic explanation has been this um, biases technological innovation towards labor saving technologies. Uh, and that's certainly part of what's going on. Um, th there's also, however, um, some significant labor intensification in some uh, uh, specialized branches of agriculture. Uh, so there's sort of all around improvement going on. I, you know, this is clearly rural capitalism. So in that sense, they're, they're capitalists. Um, but that doesn't make them like the slaveholders, uh, at least. Um, uh, so, so maybe this would, you know, you can think of this as sort of varieties of capitalism or, or different kind of capitalist trajectories that are uh, uh, taking shape in the North and the South in this period. Well, Trisha Hartage is going to take us a little bit away from slaveholding society here, Nash. Um, were there movements in Canadian agriculture that were parallel or similar but later, other nations where slavery wasn't a feature? I, you know, in terms of the, the, the sort of science and techno technology that people are interested in, uh, certainly yes. In terms of the politics, you know, no, not really, right? I mean, that, that's the, the unique sort of situation in the U.S is that uh, the politics of, of bringing this to the federal level involves a kind of confrontation with the slaveholders and that uh, in turn conditions the sort of alliances that are forged in the North uh, and the bringing together of uh, farmers and manufacturers. I mean, on the, the, the sort of the, the level of um, a kind of faith in science and te technology, I think that's really a, a very prevalent feature across uh, the 19th century in many uh, uh, Western places in particular, but I mean, also in, in places like Meiji, Japan. I mean, you, you can sort of see some similar ideas there a little bit later on. So, so that part is similar. It's the, um, it's, 
it's, it's A, the, the forms of organization that are necessitated by the particular sort of patterns of settlement in the United States, and, and B, the confrontation that is required with slaveholders at the federal level that is, uh, I think, fairly unique to the United States. But, you know, I have to admit, I don't know as much about Canada as I ought to. Well, um, I've got another question here that I think dovetails nicely with this. It's from Kimberly Jones. Uh, she returns us to the rhetoric of the image effectively. She says, the image shown equating backwardness in agricultural technique to slavery and technology in agriculture to the modern age does not seem, does not, does seem a particularly Northern idea. Did agricultural fairs make other distinctions between the type of agriculture in the North and the reliance on slave labor in the South? Yes. Um, well, I, you know, I don't know about agricultural fairs. I mean, they, they really try to be very apolitical as much as possible. And there's a whole sort of side part to this book, which I didn't get into today, uh, uh, in which I say that agricultural reformers engage in, in what I call nonpartisan anti-politics. They, they presented themselves as nonpartisan and not engage in politics at all, as if it was just sort of common sense uh, stuff that they were trying to push forward in the public interest uh, uh, when in fact they clearly had a particular kind of politics. But that meant that, you know, at these fairs, they tried very hard not to uh, appear to be um, uh, uh, sort of highly political. I mean, that said, um, it, it is pretty clear um, that agricultural reformers in the North have a, a, an idea that uh, one of the major problems with uh, Southern agriculture, Southern slave-based agriculture is that um, uh, it's terrible for the land, that it has really uh, negative environmental consequences, um, that it involves uh, basically stripping the soil of its uh, fertilizers, I mean, sorry, of its fertility, uh, and then uh, moving on to new territory. And um, you know, there's some justification for that, although there, there's also some sort of no northern chauvinism going on there. And I think there's um, uh, um, uh, Phil Harrington uh, wrote a really good dissertation at uh, UVA uh, on exactly this, um, really looking at the cultural side of this, and, and, and I'm drawing on him to, to make that argument here. So if, um, if these reform movements, these fairs are uh, um, eschewing uh, politics, we have a question here that brings us to religion. Um, Dorit Strauss asks, what role did religious institutions like churches uh, play in supporting reform in agriculture? You know, I, I don't have, a, I don't, actually, I, I don't have a good answer for that, um, other than to say that to the extent that, you know, ministers were often the kind of, uh, were, were sort of educated people in a local community um, who held some leadership position, uh, uh, they um, not infrequently were also uh, important figures in local agricultural reform institutions. So there, there are a number of, of ministers who become prominent agricultural reformers. I mean, this is certainly a period in which the kind of tensions between science and religion that um, uh, become front and center in the late 19th and early 20th century are not yet present. And um, uh, certainly in the kind of burned over district of upstate New York, um, uh, in evangelical sort of reform circles, there is not any sense that there's something incompatible between a scientific and technological sort of scientific and technological outlook on things and uh, a religious one. So, so in that sense, I think they're broadly compatible. But I, I don't have, I mean, I don't have any um, a much more sort of specific or detailed account of how exactly religion uh, or different uh, denominations may have uh, engaged with agricultural reform. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a comment then a question from Emily Connolly. Uh, she says, hey, Ariel, so excited to read the book. She's not the <laughs> only one. Thank you, Emily. Uh, she, she writes, uh, so as I understand it, part of the argument is that Southerners were interested in agricultural re were interested in agricultural reforms, but were loath to let the feds be in charge of them. Is this the argument? And if so, what were Northern and Southern visions of, agri uh, of agricultural improvement and how do they differ substantively? You know, for, for the Southern planters that I uh, quoted, guys like uh, Andrew Calhoun, um, the, the idea is that they can become uh, well versed in, it, uh, in science and basically command slaves to do their bidding. And they're kind of drawing on uh, a British or a Scottish uh, model here of great feudal lords 
who um, are able to establish, um, in some cases, you know, genuine scientific research institutions on their domains, uh, and then engage in really vast, uh, uh, you know, uh, environmental and social um, transformations on their land. And uh, a very good book on this uh, um, uh, is by uh, the historian Frederick Alberton Janssen. Uh, I'm blanking on the book's name right now, but he comes up with this term, he calls it civic cameralism. Uh, uh, and, and he's talking about these Scottish landlords who in the 18th and early 19th uh, and through mid 19th century engage in, in vast projects on their estates. And this is the thing that Andrew Calhoun is um, aiming for uh, without the involvement of the federal government. And, and the thing is that northern uh, farmers who tend to be, you know, much smaller um, farmers, but are highly literate and, and quite well educated, uh, also want the benefits of science and technology as they understand them, but they they need the government to step in and, and help them do that. Great. Jason Peen writes, uh, great talk. Um, I haven't read the book yet, obviously, but I uh, am looking forward to reading it. Did Northern agricultural reformers have a vision of what would happen to black slaves if and when the Southern agricultural economy was modernized and slavery thus became obsolete? That is a really excellent question. Um, and I think the short answer to that is not really, uh, and that that failure of vision had some real consequences uh, during the reconstruction period. And I, I end this book by asking the question, why is it that we never hear about the USDA in reconstruction? And this is really, a, 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 um, I think should be more of a mystery than people have, have uh, uh, realized because our prevailing understanding of the state in 19th century America was that it was essentially a party state, right? That whatever party was in charge uh, ran uh, uh, the sort of full panoply of agency, the federal government, according to their designs. Well, the Republicans were in charge during the Civil War and during Reconstruction, um, but they did not use the USDA to remake Southern agriculture, which was in fact the mission of Reconstruction. Uh, so um, uh, that's a real failure of vision. And uh, I attribute that to the fact that the agricultural reform movement was really organizationally quite independent of the Republican Party. It's, it's in, in some degrees a kind of marriage of convenience in the 1850s. And they start going uh, a different way after the Civil War. And, I, you know, to, to, to just make this really brief, you know, the ironic thing about the Civil War is that by destroying slavery, it actually removed a very significant barrier to national white solidarity. And what happens after the Civil War is without slavery sort of interposing itself between whites, North and South, um, uh, Southern former planters are very uh, effectively able to deploy uh, the language of white supremacy to uh, um, uh, foster North, South, uh, rural white solidarity behind expanding uh, the federal presence in agriculture. So basically, once they lost the battle for slavery, Southerners were, were more than willing to welcome the federal government in uh, on their own terms. And um, I, that plays a significant role uh, in the course of development for the USDA, the land grant universities in the country um, uh, after the Civil War and Reconstruction, and why it was not progressive at all on um, precisely the question that, that Jason is asking. Uh, that's a fantastic and, um, and, 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 you know, very um, expansive answer that I would love to continue to probe. We have, ex we, we have something like a dozen more questions in queue, but unfortunately here we are just past eight and I want to be respectful of your time and everyone else's, but I'd like to um, thank everybody in the audience for asking such um, uh, numerous and really thoughtful questions. As always, you're really helping us sustain the quality of this series, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for your participation. And of course, Ariel, thank you so much for giving us sort of first look at your book. I cannot wait to see it in thank November. You. Um, so with that, uh, thank you all. Uh, if you're looking for something to do next Thursday, same time, same place, we're going to continue doing this. Uh, we have Maria Zitaruk, uh, who is going to be presenting on 18th century seeds in the case for greening book history. I hope you'll join us. Thank you again, Ariel, and thank you all of you for joining. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Will. Cheers.